We're back in the village again where it all started, where the disciples are all the talk of village intrigue. I mean, the great adventure they were on has ended. They spent three years away following that Jesus fellow, and now here they are back again. There's seven of them. Simon and Andrew, James and John, Thomas, Nathaniel, and then two others whom we don't know. They've returned to their old lives on the sea. It's at night. They don't know what to do, so they say, let's just do what we know. Let's fish. They step into the boat, they hoist the sails, they pull the ropes, their hands feel that familiar tug. They sail into the sea and they drop their nets. In the face of crucifixion, in the face of Jesus' absence, in the face of their own betrayal and abandonment of Jesus on the cross, in the face of a threat by the Roman government of arrest and execution, they return to Galilee, where it all started. They return to their people, their community, their origins. They go back to their tribe. They go back to Galilee because they aren't really sure what to do next without Jesus. They're just simple fishermen. They don't know anything about healing people or changing the world or bringing about the reign of God. I mean, how are they supposed to stand up to this giant, overpowering Roman government? The disciples are living solely into their fear. When we get afraid, when we feel threatened, when we feel overwhelmed, we return to the people we know, to the community we are comfortable with. We return to the status quo. However, the status quo does not actually eradicate our fear. It only suppresses it. For Peter to find the courage again he must move beyond his fear of failure. He must move beyond his fear of worthiness to find the courage within him. This is the story of Peter, who was transformed from fear to courage. Peter's last exchange with Jesus was his denial which is just another step in his failure. Three times he denied Jesus while Jesus was being held in the Jewish court, waiting to be transferred to Pilate for trial. We know that the disciples deserted Jesus on the cross, but we don't know where they were. The rock, the foundation of the church was hiding. Peter was not there to hear Jesus' last words, to witness his body be taken down, to see it placed in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. This is Peter's shame. The fear that held him from showing up, the fear that kept him from his courage coming forth. Mark's Gospel says that the angel told the women, go and tell the disciples, especially Peter, that he is raised. Jesus wanted Peter to know that in his denial, in his shame, in his failure, there is still hope. Jesus knows his shortcomings and still offers him grace. Upon learning that his body is missing, John and Peter, they run to the tomb. And this demonstrates the rivalry in John's gospel because he notes that he outran Peter to the tomb. These guys were always in competition with one another. Who's going to sit on the right? Who's going to sit on the left? Who gets to the tomb the first? That Easter morning, Jesus appears to Mary of Magdala. And then the two disciples who walk on the road to Emmaus that afternoon. And then Easter evening, Jesus appears to the disciples. And then a week later, he appears to them in the upper room, but Thomas isn't there. And so Jesus has to appear again. And then this is where the original Gospel of John ends. The entire last chapter we have, chapter 21, is not included in the original manuscripts. It's an addition. 
However, the addition of Jesus on the beach with Peter is critically important because it shows Peter's full transformation. It's as if the writer is wanting us to know that this transformation is critical to the end of the story. It's not just someone thought a loose end needed to be wrapped up. It's the idea that this chapter is a gift to us as we continue to figure faith out. Again, the disciples have caught no fish. They're out there on the lake. It's early morning and they see a guy on the beach and he's actually cooking fish and he's getting breakfast going. And he shouts out, have you caught anything? And they say, no. And so he replies, well, cast your nets on the other side. And John turns to Peter and says, that's the Lord. Because Peter hasn't caught on yet. Peter jumps out of the boat. He runs as fast as he can through the shores. He leaves the net and the fish in the water. He seeks to just get to Jesus. I wonder what Peter thought as he ran to Jesus. Has he done it this time? There's no worse sin than denying Jesus, right? Will Jesus be angry? How did we ever get to this place? How had it gone so terribly wrong? Was his relationship with Jesus beyond repair? Jesus spoke softly. Simon. Jesus didn't call him by his nickname, Peter. He called him Simon. Yes, Lord. Simon, do you love me more than these? How is Peter supposed to answer that question? He failed to show his love to Jesus when he said that he never would. But he did love Jesus more than anything. You know I love you, Lord. And I sense that Peter cringed waiting for Jesus to yell at him, to throw the book at him, to scream at him. When, where were you when I needed you? But Jesus doesn't respond with anger only gentleness. Take care of my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my flock. Simon, yes, Lord, feed my sheep. And Peter knew Jesus wasn't going to toss him aside because not only did Peter still love Jesus, but Jesus still loved Peter. Not only is Jesus forgiving Peter, but he's also establishing or re-establishing Peter as the fisher of people. It's not the ending Peter expected, but it's the restoration of this disciple who lived in his fear to go and act with courage. The world says that love is a, a feeling, an emotion. But Jesus challenges us to see love as a choice. If we love Jesus, we have to serve people. In the end, this story isn't actually about Simon Peter. It's about the flock whose care has been given into his hands. It's about us. It's not about Peter being in charge. It's about our responsibility towards God's people. If we love Jesus, we love others. When Jesus says, do you love me more than these? I think he's referring to the other disciples. He, he's pointing to those who are outside of the circle, outside of the group, outside of the small world, apart. Jesus is still focused on the vulnerable and the lost and the least and the last. And frankly, if Jesus can forgive Peter, who denied him and abandoned him, then we too can be forgiven. We too can figure out how to have courage to be in relationship with others. And we know this because Jesus' last response to Peter, the end of the Gospel of John, is about reconciliation and love. One of the more important messages in John chapter 21, for us, the modern church, is the question of choice. 
Are we willing to choose to love those who sit in the pews next to us? Are we willing to choose to love those who are outside of the church? Are we going to go back to the tribe we know, go back into an in and out relationship? Or are we building a relationship with the world? If we are to be hope for those who live in darkness, then we have to cast our nets to the other side. Peter isn't just forgiven. He's established. It's not the ending Peter expected. It's the restoration of the disciple who lived in fear and now acts with courage. May God give you love to never sell yourself short. May God give you courage to risk something big for something good. And may God give you grace to remember that the world is too small for anything but love. Amen.